Well, welcome again to our Wednesday night Bible study. And so my name is Kevin. So glad for you guys to be with us uh, as always. Um, good to see you guys have been journeying with us through the entire book of Isaiah. We're going to look at uh, actually four chapters tonight in about 30 minutes. And so we won't read the complete text tonight. You can read that, of course, on your own. And I would um, encourage you to do so. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time and you've not uh, subscribed to our YouTube channel, go ahead and do that. You can see there's a small F in the corner. You'll click that. That'll take you to a way that you can subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, at Fellowship Community Church. You'll also see s sermons on there and a, a, a host of videos to help you grow in your faith walk. Um, people are always trying in some way or another, and I include myself in that, Trying to find purpose. Um, there's even uh, movies, of course, that uh, are centered around this great theme of finding purpose. Uh, several people, when they look at their jobs or vocations, they want a job with purpose. Uh, the generation, I'm 46 now, a uh, generation that is behind me has talked awful, uh, awful lot about not just wanting to just do life and but to do and have a purpose, purposeful life. Uh, there's even movies, not even based upon a human trying to find purpose, but uh, one of my f uh, children's favorite movie is A Dog's Life. And in that life and that story that's told, it's the purpose of a dog, an animal that would have some sort of purpose to it. What is your purpose? What is the complete purpose in life? We have days, moments, and hours that will add up to a lifetime. And many of us wander around with jobs, careers, lives, schedules, and they just don't seem like they have a lot of purpose. How is your purpose tied into the grander purpose of the cosmos, of the universe? Or are we just simply a speck of sand, and dust, and particles, and Things that come together and cells that make up organs, that makes up uh, systems that help our body. Are we just biological matter or is there a higher purpose to it all? And some people will search out this purpose by traveling to holy sites, holy cities. Some people will try to find an inner peace to center themselves. Some people will look to religion to find this purpose. I believe and I believe our church believes, and I believe that Isaiah believes, and I also believe that the scriptures testify the greatest purpose in a person's life is understanding and knowing who God is. Simple, but straightforward. We're going to look at four chapters today. And what we're going to look at is this question of, what is God's purpose for me? And we're going to see uh, this that not everybody gets the purpose of God, especially when it comes to different nations and different rulers. Now, last week, we looked at this understanding that um, not every human ruler is good. Many throughout history have been evil and that there is an evil hand behind that. We saw that, of course, in Isaiah 14. Now, as we look at Isaiah 15, 16, 17, and 18, we're going to see these oracles, these oracles of a sovereign, powerful God against the nations that have come up against Israel and against the hand of God. And so, as we look at this, the, um, the, 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 um, the focal verse we're going to use is out of the CSB here, and it's Isaiah 17, 13. It says, the nations rage like the rumble of a huge torrent. He rebukes them and they flee far away, driven before the wind like chaff on the hill and like tumbleweeds before a gale. Here's a central idea. God rules over the raging, turbulent sea of the nations, and here it is, to accomplish his purpose. What's his purpose? Salvation extending to the ends of the sea, ends of the world. 
That's what we're going to see here in this passage. This is, if you're a biblical student, I don't know if you've ever studied these chapters. I've been studying the Bible for a while. I've been teaching the Bible for a while. I've never taught on these uh, scriptures at all. I probably, if I was just going through my life, I've read them several times, but I would never really mind them for the depths that are there. We're going to see a connection to not only the Great Commission here, but also to several ways that throughout the scripture you see the revelation of God. Before that, we need a spirit, and we need a spirit to guide us, and we're desperate for his spirit to help us and to bring us into all understanding as we look at the historical context of the Bible today, as we study and become people of the word, who love the word, and who stand upon the word. The Lord, as we pray, God, as we open up our, the scriptures before us, the Holy Bible, and the Father God, we pray that we submit our lives to the rule and reign of Christ as he invites us into his great kingdom. We pray, Lord, that you would uncover the truths that are found in this scripture through the prophet Isaiah, and that we would love his word, and that we would obey his word, and that we would live his word. Thank you for the truth that we have in Jesus Christ, Lord, and that we are not just only those who exalt the Bible, but we exalt the God of the Bible, and we know the God of the Bible who loves us and who's who have called us according to his purpose. Father, thank you for the purpose that we have in life, Lord, and we praise these things in Christ's name. Amen. As always, you can see the notes. Now, if you go to our bio, if you go to our website, and that's uh, FCCLife.org, um, then you will see several other, other Bible studies, as we've talked about before on our YouTube channel. But also, you'll see the, where the notes that you can download those, you can print those off, you can write on those notes. We will always have them there for you, free of cost, just those notes that you can look through. Um, so here it is, the central idea. How do these chapters hang together? Here's the central idea or the central issue, okay? We've looked at the, the main idea, the central idea, but now we look at the central issue. What is it? The wise plan and the sovereign hand of God, okay? So look at um, uh, chapter 14. I'm going to read for you 16 through um, 17. It says this. Those who see you, or excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, 15, 16 through uh, 17 that we have here that we're going through. Um, it says this, it says this, this is the purpose. This is the purpose that is purposed, okay? Let's read that again, okay? This is the purpose that was purposed. So God is revealing his heart here in chapter 14. He says, concerning the whole earth. So he's going to lay it out here in chapter 14. Now, we studied chapter 14, but there were two oracles at the end that we're going to go back and look and grab, okay? And it says this, this is the purpose over the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out. Who will turn it back? We looked at this a little bit last time. But now as we look at these oracles, what are these oracles meant against the nations? I think, again, Andrew Davis, who we've been using his commentary throughout this time. It's a great commentary. I would, I would advise you to buy it, read it. It's got some great things there. We mine some truths out of that as well, some truths from the scripture here. He says this. So God strengthens the faith of his people by giving Isaiah a series of clear oracles against the nations in Isaiah 13 through 23. So this is going to extend to 23. Now, we'll look at some of these other oracles as we go along, but you're going to see these great oracles against these, these cities. And why is it? Part of the strengthening of our faith and growing in our faith is understanding the truth of God's sovereign hand as we look at circumstances that come against us. When a circumstance comes against us, whether that be a nation, whether that be a a particular uh, age that we're in, whether it be just literally any kind of circumstance that you go through financially, going through relationship problems, difficulties in your church, whatever it is, God will, if we allow him through his spirit, remind you that he'll never leave you or forsake you, the promises of God. We've talked a lot about the promises of God all throughout Isaiah, and this is what so many of Isaiah's promises are based upon the integrity of who God is and what he says and how he reveals his true nature to us. We can then lean hard into those promises, understand those promises, and take comfort from those promises. Okay, so even though the light may seem like it's dim, it's dark, we know that light has come. Um, that's a part of how the scriptures really grows us in our faith as we go through this walk together. So 
Here's the central ideal of that is that, that God, the issue, God is sovereign over all nations. We saw that in, in chapter 14. So here's four things that you can just kind of bet the barn on, okay? You can just bet the farm on um, about four things, just truths concerning the sovereignty of God over the nations, all right? Because I think even today, this is really, really, really important, is um, as we have breaking news all the time, uh, it seems like there's enemies all around, and I, I'm a United States citizen and live in the United States, but it seems like that we're surrounded by enemies, and uh, whether it be um, people in the Middle East, uh, whether it be um, uh, those who are in larger powers throughout all the earth, um, you know, attacks that are, could be biological, attacks that are... Um, uh, infectious in one sense, uh, attacks that are cyber now. Growing up, I can remember, you know, thinking about a nuclear attack from, you know, I, I grew up in the 80s in the Cold War in Russia, and you think about these great giant entities that could, could just take you out like that and the rumors of war and the threats of war. And so nations are always going to be rising up against each other, no matter all throughout the world. And so I think this is so powerful to understand these four truths about God's rule over the nations, right? Because uh, we've tried a lot of things as humans. We've tried to gather nations. We've tried to say that here's what we're going to do. We're going to form a league of nations. We're going to have the United Nations. We're going to try to make sure these atrocities don't happen. We're going to try to bring justice to the world. There's a lot of things that are happening, but ultimately we know that there is one who is over all the nations, and that is King Jesus. So here it is. First thing, God is sovereign over all nations. At any time, any place, God is sovereign over all nations, okay? All nations, we have to understand this, are sinful and corrupt and deserve the judgment of God. And that's hard to swallow, but all nations, all nations are led by broken people filled with broken folks. And we all, in some way, deserve the judgment of God. There is no utopia. There is no perfect way to do government, form nations. There are better ways than others. And I am very glad to live in a constitutional republic like we do. I appreciate that so much and the freedoms that I've been given and the men and women who have died for me to have those. But it's not perfect. And it will never be perfect. And you've got to understand that. Okay, number three. Please do not trust in the power of nations is fleeting at best. If you look throughout history, nations, even as powerful as the Roman Empire and the spread that they have, are like mushrooms that pop up over the whole breadth of the world. They rise and they fall. That's what happens. I, I, I like histories and I watch documentaries and it's amazing. Um, I watched a documentary not too long ago, pretty, pretty long, and it was the rise of you know, the Third Reich in, in the 1930s and the 40s. And you saw how quickly Hitler rose to power in that history, but then how quickly all that power came to down. Look at it. Napoleon rises to power. How quickly it came to fruition. As people rise to power, set up shop, then all of a sudden they go down. All these nations that are surrounding Israel, they have an expiration date on them, all nations have that. And then finally, we fear God and obey his commandments, which point to Jesus as the author of life. So he is the one truly who's our true king. Okay. So here we go. We're going to look at some things, some history that's going on here. I hope it's very interesting to you. Hopefully I'll explain a little bit of the Old Testament about what's going on. I've, I've told people who are, uh, I've talked to people who are students of the word that get lost in the Old Testament sometimes because of all the chrono chronologically the, the chronology and also just the, 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 the vast array of history that's there and why are things going on and when are things happening and there's a lot of that. You know, you can kind of understand a little bit more about the Gospels and, and that hundred years that we see the early church and the writing of the Gospels uh, from the birth of Christ until really we see Revelation written um, by, Jesus, by John on the Isle of Patmos. So we, you know, roughly like, you know, 80 to 90 years that we think about, but we're talking about thousands of years when we look at the Old Testament. And so sometimes it's really hard when you get into the middle of the Kings or you get into, especially in the, the first five books, you get into um, these different families as they come from Noah. What does all this mean? And so hopefully we're going we're gonna to help with that a little bit, okay? So we're going to look here in, in, in the chapter 15. You're going to see this. You're going to see this whole 15 into 16, the oracle against Moab. 
Okay, so here's the big thing that's happening. You're seeing a bunch of refugees from Moab fleeing in terror. That's what you see in this, in this chapter. I can just really look in here a little bit, and we'll go through this and look at some verses as we go around, okay? So here it is. The Moabites descended from Lot, who himself was a refugee. You remember Lot, okay? Look at this. It says in Genesis 19, 13, now Lot is the son-in-law of Abram, and he set up his, his home in Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed by brimstone and fire, and you're going to see this. Um, uh, Genesis 19, 13, we're going to see this, is that for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against his people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. These are these angels that are saying, so guess what he has to do? He has to flee. He flees, and he goes, and he actually finds a cave. He finds a cave to lodge in with part of his family. Now, one of the most bizarre and twisted stories ever in all the Bible is actually during that time, he has two daughters. Those two daughters have relations, uh, sexual relations with him, and there are children that they give birth to. You can read this passage and understand this. Okay, so you see just the epic of sin here in this place. And from one of those daughters' children is Moab. And Moab becomes the Moabite people. Kind of explains this oracle against these people that are going on here. We know this, that they're ancient enemies of Israel. I mean, all the way through. So, so here is actually, when you think about um, Moabites, okay, you're going to see actually in Deuteronomy 23, um, 3 through 6, this is what the law of God says against the Moabites and what Moses will say against the Moabites. No Ammonite nor Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the 10th generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet with you with bread and water on my way when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethra of Mesopotamia, to curse you. And the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. Instead, your Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loved you. You shall not seek their peace or their prosperity in all your days forever. And you're going to see here that the Moabites definitely try to hire a prophet against the people of Israel way in the past. But you're going to see some redemption in for Moab. Because in the book of Ruth, which we're going to be studying this summer, you're going to see that Ruth was a Moabite and is part of the lineage, ends up marrying Boaz, who's a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. So what ended up happening to Moab? Well, Assyria, we believe, through history, invaded Moab about 1715, causing these tragic events. And uh, you'll see what's going to happen in here as we look at this passage. Now, this is something very important for Christians and for anyone to understand. When you watch the news, it's very easy to become desensitized to what's happening to the plights of people around us because they're pictures. They're just pictures. And so if you're not actually in there, one of the things that we have to keep in our mind is to never become desensitized or not to be simply not to have sympathy for those who are refugees and those who are going through distress. Um, you're going to see that these people, as their cities are getting laid in waste, and as you watch news, you can watch and see horrible events and just kind of continue to go on with your life and never really think about the plight of other people around you. So we don't want to do that with this passage. These were real people in real cities that were laid waste, and this is real history of what happened to these people. Watch what it says in 15. Because heir of Moab is laid waste in a night, Moab is undone. Because Kerr of Moab is laid waste in a night, Moab is undone. So what happens? Heir and Kerr, cities destroyed in one night. Look at the next thing that happens. It says this. It says in Isaiah 15, 2. He has gone up to the temple and to Dibon, to the high places to weep, over Nebo and over Media Moab wells. On every head is baldness and every beard is shorn. You're going to see national weeping here in Moab because of what has happened. It's affected everyone. The slaughter is so terrible as you look at this. They're weeping, okay? 
Uh, it says, in the streets they wear sackcloth. Everyone wails and, me and melts in tears. Okay, they go through. If you even look in verse 9, it says, for the waters of Dibion are full of blood. The waters of Dibion upon are, are full of blood, for I will bring upon Dibion even more a line of those of Moab who escapes for the remnant of the land. So you even see like this, that there are slaughters so terrible that's going on. They're literally like birds being pushed from a nest. That's the imagery that you see here with, with Moab. It says this, like fleeing birds, like a scattered nest in 16.2. So are the daughters of Moab at the fords of the Arnon. So you see that even the women of Moab are literally just being pushed out of their home at this time, refugees. But you notice that Isaiah weeps for these people, but there is a consciousness. There is a, a heart felt brokenness for the people. And literally, as we grow closer to God, we see this in our life. Our heart should melt for those that are the distraught and the homeless and the, and, and the, the refugees of war. That there is something that when someone loses everything that they see, our heart should break for them. There should be a compassion in our heart that we have. Especially, and we're going to see this out of Christ and Paul when you look at different people. It says this, uh, Isaiah literally weeps for the refugees. We'll see this in, in Isaiah 15, 5. My heart cries out for Moab. Her fugitives flee to Zoar, to Iglath Shibasha. For the ascent of Lutha, they go up weeping. On the road to Hornum, they rise a cry of destruction. So he just doesn't look at his neighbors and say, well, I don't care what's happening to them. No, he has a heart cry for these people. Reminds us of actually Jesus as he walked through Jerusalem. It says, and when he drew near, he saw the city talking about Jerusalem, and he wept over it, saying, What would you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace? But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side, tear you down to ground. Talking about actually the, the moment when the temple is destroyed in 70 AD here at this point. You and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus here, you're going to see him holding that there is going to be destruction that even comes to Jerusalem, but look, he weeps over this. You're going to see in all this, uh, all these things. You're also going to see in um, Romans chapter 9 and verse 2, it's not in your notes, but you're going to see that Paul is is just weeping over the condition of his fellow Israelites. There's something about in this that we have to have a heart when we see, whether it's on TV or not, when we see those who are refugees, those who are displaced, those who are orphans, those who are poor, the destitute of the world, our heart should cry out. Not only are you going to see this against uh, Moab, but you're going to see an oracle against Damascus and Ephraim. You're going to see this in, in, in chapter 17 as we look through 1 through 14. And it says this, an oracle concerning Damascus. Now, what do we know of this? So Damascus is the capital of Syria. It's also called Arnhem, as you're reading and studying this. It's another enemy of Israel. Again, Israel is surrounded by all kinds of enemies. It's literally, maybe, uh, and this is a little contested, the oldest inhabited city throughout um, in, uh, throughout uh, all of history. And so Syria, uh, Damascus is still in Syria, and you're going to see it inhabited here. Um, you would probably know Damascus, if you are a believer, uh, from the conversion of Paul on the road to Damascus, and so that was uh, over 2,000 years ago. Um, we know this, that it was founded more than 1,000 years before Rome was settled in 753 um, B.C., and the oracle, it's clear, it's clear, total destruction is going to happen to Damascus. Look at uh, Isaiah 17, 1 through 2. An oracle concerning Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease to be a city and will become a heap of ruins. Cities of Ar are deserted. They will be for flocks. Wolves lie down and none of them will make them afraid. Primarily, it's going to turn into a field. 
There'll be flocks to scase it. But primarily, we're also going to see this, is that the city really never finds peace. As you look throughout this, as you read through this, that the city really never finds that peace. And even today, in that area, there's it's not really a peaceful place. Uh, you probably remembered all throughout Syria, all the refugees that were fleeing Syrian refugees, if you've watched the news or anything, as they were going through uh, a couple of years ago, as violent, militant uh, people as ISIS was going throughout all that area. Um, the city never finds peace. It reminds us of a couple of things in the scriptures. Um, it reminds us of, of actually Job 1, uh, 7. It says, the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. You see this, 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 this created being, Satan, who has no peace, he just kind of meanders around. And that's literally what this area of the world has been like. Um, Matthew 12, 43, it talks about the evilness of, of, of demons here. It says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds no one. This is literally the picture of this city uh, of Damascus and Ephraim as you read through this. Just a restless place that does not find rest at all. And here's the oracle. So as these evil cities and these evil empires are coming up against the people of God, God is saying, this is what's really going to happen to them. That in the middle of this, you're going to see a redemptive story. Probably the neatest story of all. And it's actually in chapter 18. And it's an oracle concerning Cush. Now, what is Cush? Um, Cush is the present-day day country of Ethiopia. So now you're extending this prophecy from where Jerusalem is now into northern Africa as you're, reload, as you're locating yourself on a map. Okay, Cush is the present-day country of Ethiopia. It's amazing, okay? I love the way that you think about your intricacies and the way that when God made man and he made him in the Imago Dei, that he made such a litany of ethnicities in this race that is called man from out all over the nations. And this is really where this passage connects to the Great Commission and how we see it. There's a beauty in this passage uh, that happened 700 years before some of the stories that we'll talk about that we see in Acts, okay? So in Acts 17, 26, you see this testimony and this understanding of the theology of the great God that we serve. It says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling place. It's a beautiful understanding of the sovereignty of God over all man from creation, establishing boundaries and establishing epics that they would live. So your purpose is wrought with God. You have purpose because he's established boundaries and he's established places where you would actually be. So here's amazing. Cush is located more than 1,500 miles from Jerusalem. Herodias, in his epic, The History, said this of the people of Cush. The Cushites, now this is Ethiopia, were the tallest and most handsomest men in the whole world. Even today, um, in uh, present-day Ethiopia, uh, many of the men are within the 6'4 range. It's a, a ethnicity is very tall, um, very athletic, very sleek, hunters, warriors, that they are known, um, and uh, absolutely, you'll see this this picture of them uh, here. This this ethnicity in the scriptures as is, is a scribe. Uh, myth, many prophecies tell of the people of Cush bringing gifts of worship to Jerusalem. So that there is this, even though it's fifteen hundred miles away, you see this connection throughout the scriptures. Watch this. It says this: um, a Noble shall come from Egypt, Cush shall hasten to stretch out her hands to God, Psalm 68, 31. Again, Psalms 87, 4. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon, Philistia and Tyre and Cush. This one was born there, they say. And so you see from Cush, as you look at this, you're going to see these men and these women who God is working in in this redemptive place. It's amazing as you look at this. Let me read a little bit from the scriptures. It says, 
all land of whirling wings that is beyond the rivers of Cush, which sends ambassadors by the sea, the vessels of papyrus on the water. Go, you swift messengers, to a nation's tall and smooth. Again, you see this, um, this recording of these people who live in Cush in Ethiopia. To a people feared near and far, a, my, a nation mighty and conquering, whose land the rivers divide. And all you who inhabitants of the world, you dwell on the earth. When a signal is raised on the mountains, look when a trumpet is blown here. So watch. It's saying to it's saying to Cush, when you hear the oracles of God, listen, understand, know there. For thus the Lord has said to me, I will quietly look for my dwelling like a clear heat in sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For before the harvest, when the blossom is over and the flower becomes a ripening grape, he cuts off the shoots with pruning hooks and the spreading branches he loops and clears away. Then shall all that be left, the birds and prey of the mountains and the beasts of the earth and the birds of prey and summer on them and all the beasts of the earth will winter on them. Now watch verse 7. At that time, tribute will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth, from a people feared near and far, a nation mighty and conquering whose lands the river divide to Mount Zion, the place of the Lord of hosts. 1,500 miles away, God would do a work in the land of Cush. Where do we see a land throughout all the scriptures? Where do you see God's wonderful work being done in a land so far away, in the present day land of Ethiopia? In Acts 8, 33, 31 through 37, throughout all of Acts, you see this wonderful picture as God's earth is being covered with the glory of the Lord, listen to the word of God. A man named Philip comes to a man who's an Ethiopian eunuch, a Cushite, tall and smooth and mighty. And he said how he asks him in the account of the Ethiopian eunuch as he's reading Isaiah. <laughs> he's reading Isaiah. Why? Because it talks of his people, I believe. And he's reading Isaiah, and he's reading this prophet. And Philip comes to him, and he said, Do you know what it's saying here? And the Ethiopian eunuch picked it up, and he said, How can I, unless someone guides me, talking about how can he understand Isaiah, which we're trying to do today. And he invited Philip to come and sit with him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was like this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before it shear is silent, so he opens on his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom I ask you does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? There's the, there's the question. Who is this one Jesus? And Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he told the good news about Jesus. And as they're going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's your purpose, Christ. That's your purpose, church. You find it in Christ. That no matter where people are, no matter what nationality, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what plague they're going through, no matter if it's a refugee, the downcast, or even someone who is totally different from you, the one thing that unites us is the gospel of Christ. And the one thing that beckons our heart to go is the gospel of Christ. You see here, the people of Cush have seen and have come to Zion. And it's because of the gospel of Christ. I don't know if you've ever studied these passages, but it has been a treat to study them with you. And I hope that this is encouraging you as you go along in your faith journey. As always, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll have all kinds of ways that you can be connected to our church and in the life and body of Jesus Christ. It's been great being with you. I pray that this has helped you in your faith walk.